Good morning. morning. Happy Easter. Easter. Most of you probably know how this works. I say he is risen. You say he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, happy Easter to all. I am David Sheeler. I am pastor here at First Presbyterian Church of Dunedin, and it is a delight to welcome all who gather uh, on this beautiful Easter morning, both in here, out there, in person, online, no matter where we may be in this moment. I know that it is the risen Christ uh, who welcomes us uh, with all of God's love and grace that heals and brings life. So again, welcome to everyone this day. Now, this being uh, Easter Sunday, we are going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So if you're here in person, you may see, we see stacks of trays here. We're going to pass trays with the elements in them. If you would prefer, though, we do have prepackaged uh, elements here uh, on the side. If you raise your hand briefly, our ushers can make those available. But otherwise, we will pass these plates later on in worship. If, you, uh, w- if you're uh, worshiping online today, feel free to grab whatever is handy or convenient for you that may substitute for bread and cup. And feel free to uh, use those uh, elements that you may have, knowing that whoever we are and whatever we have, God takes us and the gifts that we bring and uses them and us for God's purpose. Well, we have come here for worship. We is God who greets us. Oh, I forgot one thing. I'd like to know who you are. So if you're here this morning, I invite you to pick up the black pad that's at the center aisle end of each pew. It says Friendship register on it. You can put your name in there. You can share as much contact information about yourself as you are comfortable in sharing and make sure that others get the same opportunity uh, to do that. If you're worshiping online, you can put a little comment in the comment box or anybody here or there can certainly check in to social media this morning. Well, let us do what we've come here to do and let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
God of resurrecting power, you lift our hearts with joy when we see the tomb is empty. God of resurrecting hope, you fill us with excitement when we hear that Christ is risen. God of resurrecting love, you embrace us with courage when we trust in the power of new life that you promise in the risen Christ. We offer you all glory, honor, and praise with hearts overflowing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. pray with me. God of resurrecting joy, we confess it's not easy to sustain Easter hope. We let distrust, fear, and frustration settle in, and we let anger and anxiety turn our hearts away from you. Resentment and disappointment cling to us, and we forget your great mercy and love. Forgive us, Restore us and hope promised in Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. 
Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Jesus. Christ, we are forgiven and set free for new life by God's resurrecting grace. Please be seated. I want to invite the Reverend Carol Weiss to come forward as she makes her way down through what is a very full uh, chancel this morning. I want to tell you why I've invited her down. Uh, We tell stories here because stories have power and meaning. And in our stories, we recognize God's presence at work. In fact, one of the stories that I love in the Gospels uh, post-resurrection is found in Luke when two of his disciples are, are walking along the road and a stranger appears uh, with them, starts talking with them. And only after they sit down to dinner and that stranger breaks bread and passes cup, do they recognize that Christ has been in their midst? Well, one of the great gifts that we have in this congregation is that we've got some parts 
of this congregation that are kind of seasonal with us. They're here for a time, especially this time of year. In fact, this Sunday marks the saying goodbye to many of our uh, seasonal parts of, of our congregation. But while they are with us, breaking bread and sharing cup and worshiping and joining in ministry and mission, we are certainly aware of their presence and Christ's presence among us. So one of those seasonal folks is Carol. So Carol, come tell us about how you see God at work here. Thank you, son. <laughs> One year ago, I came to Dunedin, Florida at the invitation of my son, Lucas Weiss, and my new son-in-law, Scott Wilburn, to visit them in their Clearwater home and to enjoy Florida's amazing climate during February and March. Now, as an Ohio native, you have to understand, I'm accustomed to mostly overcast days. They did a study of Ohio weather and determined that out of 365 days a year, we have 63 with sun. <laughs> so I was pleasantly surprised by Florida's sunshine and soothing breezes. But what I had not anticipated was encountering Dunedin First Presbyterian Church's open hearts and open arms. The ongoing effect of a congregation discovering what it truly means to be the beloved community of Jesus Christ in this place. Now let me explain. I've been involved in Presbyterian churches for 76 years, and I've been a full-fledged member for 70 years. Growing up as a farm girl in eastern Ohio, you see my grandparents were immigrants from Czechoslovakia. My parents were from coal mining families and both only able to complete eight grades of education. So one of four children to Anna and Albert, I saw before me a limited future. I would graduate high school, they insisted. I would get married, of course, and hopefully have a polka band. However, along the way, I became involved in the local country Presbyterian Church. And that same denomination, Presbyterian, stepped in by making possible my college education with a liberal arts degree from Muskingum University, and then led me on to a Master of Divinity degree from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And I have to tell you, way back in those dark ages when I was in seminary, the first class I attended, I got there just under the wire as the bell was ringing, and the only seat left was right in the front row. So I slid in, the professor came right in behind me, he got his watch on his hand, and he said, good morning. He looked down at me and he said, gentlemen. Well, later on, with my ordination as Minister of Word and Sacrament in 1967, I became the 40th female clergy in our worldwide Presbyterian Church. That's utterly amazing, but it was by God's grace, so let's have an amen. amen. Yes, I've been around the Presbyterian Church for a while. There's not too much that shocks me or surprises me. My 57 years as pastoral ministry in a wide variety of churches from a congregation of 12 members who barely kept the lights on and the furnace going in winter, all the way to leading a suburban Pittsburgh congregation of 2,300 members with its midweek children and youth program, which I was in charge of, of 500 young people. 
So I've been there, I've done that, and then some. But my last 10 years, as I've tried to retire, they've been spent rescuing congregations who have fallen on hard times in Ohio. Victims of the Rust Belt decline with Ohio's economic disaster and the subsequent brain drain, and then the life-threatening shutdown by COVID with its seeming paralysis. Ohio has experienced widespread hopelessness, especially debilitating for educational and cultural venues, plus having a direct impact on mainline churches. So lately, I've been sent by our presbytery back in Ohio to assist struggling congregations who are wondering what in heaven's name has hit them. Now, this type of ministry is challenging. It's downright tiring for everyone. And I'm happy to report that a few of those congregations where I've been sent are now in recovery, which again is God's amazing grace. But I do have to report that others have been graciously accompanied to their closure, sometimes lovingly, sometimes convulsively. Yet here in Dunedin, I've encountered a warm embrace, both last year on my first sojourn south and again this year. And it has made me realize how poor in spirit I had become, how parched was my soul for God's quenching life, life renewing water. And the deep friendship extended to me by your caring pastor, who I call my other son, David Sheeler, has been such a blessing for me. His keen biblical knowledge, week after week, challenges and inspires me. Well, to all of you, First Presbyterian fellow seekers, plus my musical comp compadres up here, you know, in various uh, iterations, I want you to please receive my deep, deep thanks for showering me, a worn out preacher lady from Ohio, with your overwhelming loving kindness, as the Jews say, chesed, you have given me chesed. First Presbyterian Church's beloved community, you have revived my spirit and you have restored my soul. With the love of God, as we know it through Jesus, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our constant companion. And for this, may all God's people say, Amen. Amen.
Change our lives with this gift. Alleluia. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson on this Easter Sunday comes to us from the 25th chapter of Isaiah. Hear these ancient words as we celebrate this day. On this mountain, the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations, he will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in this salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
as our uh, string quartet makes their uh, way off of the chancel this morning, I, I want to just observe, I'm, I'm certainly mindful of it as a preacher, that there are some Sundays and there are some scriptures where the best way, really perhaps the only way to really capture them, to do them justice, is, is in music, is in poetry. So I'm grateful to have such beautiful musicians and singers, uh, the, the string quartet this morning, and Lucas and Susan, our accompanists, and you all as choir, and certainly all of you lifting up your voices uh, in music and song. You do uh, this Easter morning uh, beautifully well. So thank you, thank you for that. Now, all that being said, it doesn't mean I'm not going to try a little spoken word, uh, so I will do that. You're not off the hook in that, with that regard, uh, but we are going to turn this morning to uh, what you might imagine, story of the resurrection as recorded in Mark's gospel, the 16th chapter. I'm going to spend just a moment, actually, and get a little Bible geeky on you uh, and remind everybody, if you don't already know, you may already be aware, that... Um, when it comes to scripture, we don't have the original of anything. No uh, original copy of Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. No original copy of, of the epistles or the rest of the, the New Testament. All we have are copies, or often copies of copies. And of course, in the first century, we didn't have Xeroxes, copy machines, or, or digital scanners, things like that. If you wanted to make a copy of something, well, somebody stood up with the original, and they just spoke it. Where and then scribes, people would be at their desk with quin and, and uh, uh, quill pen and, and ink, trying to write down what it was that the that the person was was dictating uh, to the to the room. And as you might imagine, sometimes people got things maybe a little wrong. Sometimes people decided that, well, Scripture really shouldn't say that. It ought to say this, make little changes and edits along the way. Now, now nothing stupendous, nothing earth-shattering, all the, the Dan Brown conspiracy theories aside, Scripture isn't really all that different, the copies that we have. There are good reasons we picked the things that we picked uh, for the, the canon of Scripture. But still, there's some differences, and scholars spend a lot of time and energy. There's, there's been a lot of PhD dissertations uh, on, on people trying to decide, did this writer say this, or did this writer say this? Did this, writer, this text uh, be phrased this way, or should this text be phrased that way? And one of the most interesting places that that pops up actually in, is in Mark's Gospel. Here at the end of Mark's Gospel, that's why I took all this effort to bring it up this morning. In fact, so much so that most biblical scholars now agree uh, that Mark's gospel actually ends with verse 8 here in the 16th chapter. The verses 9 through 20 were something that some editor added along the way just because they weren't comfortable with the way that Mark ended his gospel. And the way that they know this is because the oldest copies that we have of Mark, again, all copies, but the oldest ones we have, stop at verse 8. So I invite you, you'll hear, it makes sort of an interesting ending to Mark's gospel, and so I invite you to, to hear and listen for that this morning. Again, Mark 16, verses 1 to just verse 8. But let's listen again for God's word. Now when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices, bought spices, so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were very alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, but well, he has been raised. He is not here. Look, <clears throat> there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. 
So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. If you would join me in just a, a brief moment of silent meditation as we center ourselves, please, please pray with me. Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, they were just doing what you did at the time of death. Those women, those three women that were there at the tomb, what turned out to be an empty tomb, there on the first, first Easter morning, they were just doing what you did when someone had died. Mark tells us they bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. They bought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus' body. They were just doing what you did when death came. And it was a very important task to be done. After all, this is a warm Mediterranean climate. They did not have the modern luxuries of, of refrigeration or, or, or modern embalming. In other words, to say that in the hot Mediterranean sun and air, bodies began to decay. And then when they quickly began to, get to decay, they stank. They simply smelled. Uh, there's no way to put a, a, a more delicate point on it. Dead bodies quickly begin to smell. In fact, a little more than a week before, Jesus had been at the home of, of Mary and Martha and been there for the to grieve with them the death of their brother, Lazarus. They had been friends together, and, and Jesus had, had come there as they grieved again Lazarus's death. Jesus, of course, had other ideas in mind, and he, he commanded that Lazarus's tomb be opened and that he be brought and called out. But as soon as Jesus ordered that command, oh, one of his sisters stated the obvious, but Jesus, he stinks. He's been dead. He smells. It's horrible. Please, Jesus, don't do that. So that's what the women were doing. That's what you did when death happened. You brought fragrant spices. Fragrant spices to spread over the body to try to do something to abate the smell, the stench, the impact of death. In fact, some have suggested that our tradition of bringing flowers to a funeral it comes out of that tradition of just trying to cover up the smell, the stink, the stench of death. Of course, we try to do all sorts of things to soften death's blow. We bring flowers, we bake casseroles, we, we, we cook pies and cakes. We, we try to find some kind words, offer some condolences, maybe write a, a, a bereavement card. We struggle with what to say, what to do. I think we struggle because we know that in the end, there really isn't anything you can do, not completely, to cover up, to make, to lessen the, the, the sting and the stench of death. Death stings. It smells. It's heartbreaking. Nothing, no, bake, no cake we can bake, no pie we can offer, no, no, no condolence we can give, no big bouquet of flowers will ever, will ever completely make up for the stench, for the sting of death. Of course, the sting and the stench of death isn't the same all the time, is it? I mean, different deaths sting and stink more than others. A number of years ago, both of my parents died uh, almost nine years apart, but both of them around the age of 85. My father had had pretty severe advanced dementia. My mother dealt with heart disease. But when their deaths came, oh sure, I was full of grief. I was very sad. 
And, and, and certainly, as I've counseled plenty of people before, there was something when my mother's death came and I found myself as, a, as an adult orphan without any parents living. I, I, I felt that in my, my own heart and being. But that was to be expected. That's what happens. They had had long, full lives. Their deaths were to be expected. Again, not all deaths are the same. They sting and stink differently. Because compared to them and, and their advanced years, a, a child's death, that doesn't even compare. Or, or a, a premature death, someone cut down in the prime of their lives. Or even worse, an unjust death. My parents died of natural causes in their advanced years, but an unjust death? A death that could have and should have been uh, avoided? A, a death that happened because somebody somewhere did something wrong? Oh yes, not all deaths are the same. Some of them sting and stink more than others. Some of you may have heard in the news a few weeks ago a, a, a young teen in Oklahoma, next Benedict, a, a, a trans teen. She had been, he had been uh, bullied and in fact even beaten up severely in, in the bathroom of, of the high school where he went to school. And so distraught at the, the, the torture and the bullying that he had endured, he took his own life. Like I said, not all deaths sting and stink the same. Some sting, some stench is much harder, much, much harder to mitigate. And Jesus' death, well, it stung, it stunk a whole lot. I mean, here we have a young man in his 30s, in his 30s, and he was a kind, compassionate, caring man. And he did good things in this world. He stood up for the poor and the oppressed. He didn't mind speaking truth to, to power in the world. And he healed. He healed people. Brought them life, abundant life. He had done so many good things. But then he was killed. Unjustly killed. Killed legally. <laughs> but unjustly, killed by a, a, a conspiracy between religious authorities and the, the, the power of the state. And people had placed so much hope on him, so much hope that, that somehow with him things would be different, hope for somehow that, that he would really bring about real change. In fact, one of his disciples, speaking about his death, said, we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. They had hoped. They had hoped that finally they would, would be redeemed. They would hope they would finally throw off the shackles of, of the oppression of the Roman Empire. Uh, they thought that, that they would hoped that perhaps now a new day would dawn. They had hoped. But is there anything sadder than hope, than hope in the past tense? We had hoped. We don't hope anymore. Someone dies whom we have loved, who held so much of our hope, so much of our life, and I will tell you, it is impossible to cover up that sting, to cover up that stench. Not all the flowers in the world will cover it up. But still the women went. They went there to do what they did at the time of death. They went there to anoint him, to offer some sweet-smelling spices, to try to at least mitigate the smell, the sting, the pain of it all. You know, I, I don't think it's, it's coincidental that these were women. The men, of course, had long fled. Uh, they had, had run away a long time before. No, it was women who came to the empty tomb. In fact, I saw in my Facebook feed this week, if you were going to have an authentic Easter, we ought to invite only women because they were the only ones around to see it. But it's what women did. It's the duty that they had. But more than just what they did, I think it was also what they were used to. 
what they were accustomed to. They knew what it was like to have hope in the past tense. Remember a few years ago when, when we saw the, when he saw the video of the Minneapolis police officer murder George Floyd, I will say that I, along with a lot of other white folks, were shocked. We were shocked at what we saw, saddened, angry. But I talked to my American, African American friends. They were sad, they were angry. But I tell you, they weren't shocked. There are some people who are just simply more used to hope in the past tense. So women arrive. These women who had hope in the past tense, they arrive to try to, again, to lessen the stench of death. And they meet this strange, this mysterious man who, who shows up there in the tomb. It's not who they were expecting. And more importantly, he has a word that they don't expect at all. He says to them, he has been raised. He is not here. You're looking in the wrong place. I know that you expected your dead friend's body to be lying here in the tomb. But things change. There's new news. Something else has happened. He has been raised. He's not here. And the women? <laughs> it's more than they can possibly comprehend. They can't get their heads around it. Or their hearts around it. Mark tells us that they were afraid, they were terrified, they were amazed. And in fact, with the cliffhanger of all cliffhangers, Mark says, they said nothing to anyone. Now, of course, we have Mark's gospel, so you, we figured eventually their mouths opened up and they told the story. But in that moment, in that moment, they could not find the words. They could not find the faith to believe what it is that they saw right there in front of them. They just couldn't comprehend it, much less accept it. You know, I think there may be, in fact, something good with the idea that maybe Mark stops his gospel right there with the women running away, afraid to say anything to anyone. I think it may be good because I... I bet that there are some people right here, right now, who also stop right there. I know sometimes I do. Sometimes I can't go any further than that point. Maybe we have a, a scientific, a rational mind. So we think to ourselves, how can this be? How is this scientifically demonstrable? Uh, how could this possibly be, this resurrection story? But I think it's more than our scientific minds that question I think it's our, what's our doubtful minds. Not just how can this be, but how can I hope? How can I have hope that this really is true? I mean, we wonder, maybe, maybe it's better if we, we don't hope at all. I mean, after all, don't the good seem to always die young? Doesn't it seem that no good deed goes unpunished? Doesn't it seem like day after day after day there's injustice piled on injustice piled on injustice that might makes right, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the world falls apart? Maybe it's just better to not hope. Maybe it's better just not to believe that things, that things are actually changing. That the Apostle Paul, when he writes later, that this isn't just, this resurrection thing isn't just a, a one-time event, but Paul dares to say it's just a first fruit. A first fruit of the whole world's redemption. Maybe it's better just not to hold on to that kind of hope, to dare to have that kind of hope. Maybe, maybe like those women, we hear that sound, those words, he has been raised, and we are amazed, we're doubtful, we're fearful, and we dare not say anything to anyone about it. Well, that's okay. I will say, if that's you this morning, if that's where you are stopping right there with those women, that's okay. Because you know what else I know? I know that resurrection does not depend on us, thanks be to God. 
Resurrection does not depend on us. It doesn't depend on you and me. It's not waiting around for you and I to, 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 to consciously assent to this idea. This is God's doing. It's not ours. Resurrection doesn't depend on our hope or our doubt. It doesn't depend on our confidence or our fear. It doesn't depend on our action or our inaction. God's resurrection power is already up and out of here and active. We can join in if we like. Oh, I pray that we like. I pray that we join in, but it is happening without us. That ship has sailed. But for now... For now, right now, I get it. Maybe it's too much to go there. Maybe it's hard to to, to raise our voices with gusto, with he is risen, he is risen indeed. Maybe it's okay, just like those women, to sit here for a moment with with amazement, with, with, with fear, unable to move, unable to speak, unable to trust, unable to hope. Maybe it's okay just to spend a few moments and time letting that resurrection news sink in a little bit. To hear those words repeated over and over, he has been raised, he has been raised. And maybe too, maybe too it's okay for us to just take little steps in that direction. You often hear people say at the time of death, Sometimes you just have to put one foot in front of the other. Just keep moving forward as best you can. Maybe when resurrection comes, maybe that's the best we can do too. Just put one foot in front of the other for resurrection. Just take little steps, move in that direction uh, with perhaps some fear and trembling, but a little bit of trust. Maybe that is true. And maybe... Maybe with that strange man there at the tomb, it's also okay for us to just say it. To say it to ourselves, maybe quietly, maybe in a whisper, over and over and over again, until we can wrap our heads around it. Till we can wrap our hearts around it. Till we can wrap our lives around it. Just trying to comprehend, he is risen. He is risen indeed. 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 Hallelujah. Amen.
Please be seated. Well, we come to the table today on this Easter day. And we come probably because we don't have it all figured out. We don't have all the questions answered. We don't have all the certainty in the world, all the confidence in our actions. If you do, God bless you. Thanks be to God. But I don't think it's a requirement. Just a willingness. Just a willingness to take a little taste. Just a willingness to, to see a little bit further. Just a willingness to, to take a little step to trust. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, that that strange man at the tomb, maybe he was right. Maybe he really is raised, this Jesus of ours. Maybe. Well, if you're willing to take a little risk with me, I invite you here to the table, to bread and cup, trusting that somehow maybe Jesus is here, the risen one is in our midst. As I've said before, the church has spilled a lot of ink over 2,000 years trying to explain what happens here. And I won't try to do that. Just trust. Just trust that he is here, the risen one, the resurrected one. And that maybe by taking a little taste, by, by catching a little glimpse, we're all come from south and west, south and north and east and west, and, and sit here for just a moment in God's presence sitting here with our host who welcomes us all, that we, will be, that we will be given the confidence, the Spirit will bless us and give us the strength to not only believe it, not only to say it, but to live it, to live resurrection life in the world. I remind us, of course, this isn't our table. It's not a Presbyterian table. It's the Lord's table. And he invites you, each and every one of us, to come taste and see and know his goodness, his resurrection goodness this day. Come. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. What great joy it is to praise you today, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. Your command created earth and spun it on its course among the planets. Your hands shaped our bodies from the dust. Your spirit breathed life into us and set us among all your creatures to love and serve you. Your love remained steadfast and you kept faith with us even when we were unfaithful to you. Your prophets spoke of love and justice and in Jesus, your word made flesh. You lived among us, manifesting your glory. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He came with healing in his touch and was wounded for our sins. He came with mercy in his voice and was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and a horrible death. By your power, he broke free from the prison of the tomb on this Easter day. He who humbled himself is raised to rule over all creation, the lamb upon the throne. The one who ascended on high is with us always as he promised. Alleluia. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, forever and ever, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He was at table with his disciples, and our Lord took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this, remembering me. In the same manner, after supper, our Savior also took the cup and pouring it said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Drink of it, all of you. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, the Apostle Paul reminds us, we proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again and makes his resurrection complete.
served who wish to be served? Please pray with me. Holy God, resurrected Lord, we give you thanks. We may not understand it, we may not comprehend it, we may not be able to wrap our heads, our hearts, our lives completely around it. But we took a little step today, had a little taste, a glimpse, took a step towards your resurrection life for us and for the world. And so we pray that you will bless us and the step, the step that we have taken, that you will empower us, you will enable us, not just to hear the resurrection promise, not just to, to say it, but to live it, to live in the life and the love and the hope that we have seen. Holy God, we pray for the world around us that is in need of such life, such abundant healing life, for works of justice, of righteousness, of love and peace. We pray for those particularly who are grieving this day, the death, the loss of a loved one. We pray for Bruce Spear and family after the death of his uncle Irvin. We pray for Marcy Carnavale after the death of her sister Carol Ann. We pray for Marion Young and others after the death of his friend Stephanie. We pray for those who seek resurrection life and healing and strength at home, hospital, nursing care. We pray for Alan Fraser's brother Don, for Marge Ralph's cousin Don, for Ruth Baldwin's brother Don. We pray for Betty Arnold, for Emma Fordham, for Rita Winrose uh, relative Duncan Quinn. We pray for Susan Spears' friend Lee. We pray for all who continue to seek healing and peace, even in the healing and peace, even in the midst of, of disaster, of violence, and war. And again, O oh God, we pray for ourselves that day by day, step by step, word by word, we may receive the good news that he has been raised. He is not here. Alleluia. Amen. Well, I do invite us not just to hear the words of resurrection life, not just to try to wrap our hearts and heads and lives, hearts and heads around it, but also our lives as well, to, to fulfill that, that cliffhanger there at the end of Mark's gospel that we might go and tell in word and in deed. All sorts of opportunities that we have to do that as a community, collectively, uh, if you are here in person, there are our news and notes uh, newsletter that you can uh, find as you exit today, or you can subscribe and receive that on Monday mornings uh, every week. A few things to note is that we have some mission opportunities that are coming up uh, this week with uh, free produce for uh, senior adults in need, as well as dropping off uh, food. Uh, for people in our community in need that we offer through Dead Eden Cares and also uh, feeding uh, our houseless folks at, at uh, Pinellas Hope coming up uh, soon. Also, in a couple of weeks, we'll celebrate here, uh, celebrate uh, our and this town's Scottish heritage with our uh, annual Kirkin of the Tartan service. I hope that you'll come and be a part of that. Of course, also this day we receive, as we do every year, the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. And this is a national offering, not just to the Presbyterian Church, but the, the Methodists, and the Lutherans, and the Episcopalians join us in it to uh, help folks, to offer assistance with folks who are particularly in crisis, both locally and globally. So you'll find some flyers and some offering envelopes uh, up here in the back if you'd like to give to that, or you can simply make payments payable to the church and just mark it One Great Hour, or OGHS, and we'll make sure that it gets in the right place. But let us continue to worship God, in not only in word, but also in deed. Thanks be to God.
Just a couple of notes as we say goodbye to one another. Uh, one, is there a time of fellowship, of just good uh, building a beloved community in uh, Hager Hall or Fellowship Hall, which is uh, behind me out these doors and up the ramp to my right as you head out toward the parking lot. There'll be coffee and refreshment there and good fellowship. So I hope that you'll take some time to hang out there uh, quite a bit. I personally will be right here uh, beside the Lord's table. Uh, if you'd like to pray together one-on-one -on -one today, I certainly would welcome that. Or if you're new, relatively new, I hope you'll come by and introduce yourself because I would love a chance to meet you. But go, take a little step. Trust a little bit. Hope. Hope against hope. Hope against logic and reason. Hope that, in fact, the news is true, that we can hear it, we can live it, and maybe... Maybe we can even start to say it, even amidst our doubts, even amidst our fears, even the midst of our stumbling and bumbling around, to say those words that we've been told to be true. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.